story of the Wreckers is sort of based on fact, and so, but it's sort of mythology and sort of fairy tale and almost like a ghost story mixed together, um, which I think is most interesting that it's not just sort of a documentary of how things were in Cornwall in the 18th century, but um, the story itself was actually inspired um, when the composer, when she herself was on a holiday in Cornwall and with walking along the, the rugged coast and then hearing these stories of what had happened a hundred years before. Around Cornwall is really dangerous. It's a very rocky uh, coastline uh, which is prone to uh, really dangerous storms. And so in a busy shipping corridor, obviously there's going to be shipwrecks that get washed up onto the sea. People that are living in the villages near the sea uh, would go down to provide assistance to the sailors and the hundreds of people that were on the boats and then also to recover some of the merchandise that was washed up. But the sort of the mythological aspect that sort of came about um, with the story of these Cornish wreckers was that uh, in order that they didn't have to give anything back to the rightful owners, they would make very sure that there were no survivors. So even if there was a, a ship that was crashing against the rocks and all of the goods and the, the riches that were on the ship were coming aboard with some sailors who were also alive, maybe not doing very well swimming in the, the stormy seas. The, the myth goes that the, the Cornish wreckers would um, stab them and kill them and make sure that there were no people alive that could make a claim to what they got. And then it even takes on a further kind of um, almost like fundamentalist, fanatical, religious quality to it that they believe that God was providing these storms um, to bring them the things that they needed to survive. The story is really interesting because it's set in this context of uh, the wreckers. You have these, these sort of impoverished people that are fanatical, you know, prayers, crying out to the, the gods. It, it's, it's almost like Greek mythological proportions saying, send us a storm, you know, wash these things up, up upon our shore. So here you have a situation by a town, of a town that uh, lives by absolute evil, by uh, destroying uh, the property and lives of others, and at the same time is ethically deeply puritanical and believes itself to be Christian. So you have the conflict between the economic behavior of the town and its presumed moral uh, self-image. So um, as this uh, town goes about its business, um, there are members of a young, younger generation who find this um, a combination of uh, thievery and piety uh, to be uh, not worthy of support, difficult to comprehend and digest. But in the middle of that, you've got um, this it's an angry congregation that's led by a preacher, Pasco, um, and, but Pasco's wife is uh, Tirza. She's this one woman that's sort of the voice of, of dissent against everything that's happening around. She's saying, this is crazy. She's like, God's not sending us shiploads full of people to die for our benefit. She's like, that just doesn't make sense. That doesn't compute. And I think that Tirza becomes this really interesting focal point in the middle of it, that you sort of have this real imbalance between one woman's voice uh, against uh, this entire sort of male-dominated religious fundamentalist society. So this is a fantastic opera. So you have this group, which becomes the chorus, the town. Uh, you have the religious aspect. Uh, you have uh, terrific crowd scenes. You have a, a complicated love relationship between the wife of someone and a young man and another woman, Avis, who is actually in love with Mark. And you have a number of characters, pretty economically done, uh, who in, engage in the drama of the opera and it has a fabulous ending. So it, is, um, it has somewhat of a Wagnerian uh, cast to its uh, uh, dramatic challenges. It's written in a fabulous uh, late 19th century romantic idiom, beautiful. It has very many um, uh, light touches to its, its, its score. Ethel Smythe uh, takes things that uh, will remind listeners, to some extent almost, of uh, Operetta Gilbert and Sullivan, also of French models, Bizet and others. But its basic framework is of a late post-Wagnerian 
uh, music drama and uh, fabulous music, uh, fabulous beginning, fabulous choral scenes, uh, very well paced, and it comes to a glorious conclusion, not for the lovers, but for the audience. It is a fantastic score with a fantastic story. And uh, it is um, Peter Grimes before Peter Grimes in terms of the setting and the nature, the darkness of the story. And it is um, just a fabulous piece of dramatic music and deserves to be part of the repertory.